Hi, my name is uh, JB Morin. I'm a professor at the University of Nice in France. And I'm going to present you uh, the workshop that we have presented uh, at the IOC World Conference on Prevention of Injury and Illness in Sports in Monaco with my colleague Dr. Pascal Edouard from the University of Saint-Étienne in France. So first of all, I would like to apologize for uh, all the, the English native speakers. Uh, the good thing about being French is that, well, basically you're French, but the bad thing is that uh, sometimes you have a shitty uh, English accent and I, I, I want to apologize for that. I hope it will be, it will be okay for you. So uh, basically, uh, I will explain you the approach that we have and we call that the win-win strategy because we think that a better um, analysis of sprint acceleration mechanics may be related to a better and improved uh, hamstring uh, strain injury uh, management. So we all started in uh, 2007, that's almost 10 years ago, and basically some parts of what I'm going to present you today uh, will lead nowhere, and that's science. Uh, some of the doors we open absolutely lead nowhere, but fortunately enough, some of the doors we open uh, lead somewhere, sometimes. But until then, um, we will try and we will see. I want to thank um, my colleagues here because it's a, it's a cycle. Our research is a mix between uh, sports performance, uh, biomechanics, sports physiotherapy, and this is um, the role that plays Jordan Mendiguccia in our research, and sports medicine. And uh, this is the role played by Dr. Pascal Edward. And we are constantly trying to see sprinting performance and hamstring uh, injury as a, as a whole, uh, as only one topic. So let's talk about the what. What are we talking about? Well, basically, uh, most of you very likely know that um, hamstring strain injury, uh, non-contact hamstring injuries are uh, related to sprint. And it's the number one non-contact sports in, in um, injury, sorry, in many sprint sports. Uh, track and field, obviously, uh, but also soccer, rugby, etc. And the big issue with this kind of injury is that um, uh, personally and economically it's a, it's, a, it's a disaster for professional sportsmen. But it's also a big issue because um, it's a very recurrent injury. So the frequency of re-injury is very high. And once you've been injured, you have a major factor for a next injury. And one of the most uh, modifiable uh, factors, the, the, the factors we can act upon, is uh, basically sprint mechanics and, 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 and hamstring mechanics. That's what we are going to, to study now. So basically, what does the literature say? Uh, well, now we have meta-analysis uh, reviews showing that basically um, hamstring injuries induce a loss of hamstring strength. So you can see that in, in, in many sportsmen, after a hamstring injury, the strength of these muscles is impaired. That's clear. Then the next thing is that um, if you take a reduced hamstring strength as, a, I don't like the word predictive, but as, as a factor related to a hamstring strain injury, then yes, you can see that in isokinetic testing, uh, it's been pretty clearly showed in the literature that um, an imbalance and, and, a, and a low hamstring to quadriceps ratio or functional ratio was related to a higher risk of injury that was uh, observed um, in, in soccer players. We have also this kind of data now in uh, competitive sprinters and a very recent and very interesting uh, cohort study by Nicole van Dijk showed that basically, yes, the isokinetic strength testing was related to risk injury, but as you can see in the title, the um, the quadriceps isokinetic strength and the hamstring to quadriceps strength ratio is a weak risk factor. So, yes, it is related, but the strength of the relationship is, is pretty low. Now, the next part of, of the literature is uh, not on isokinetic testing of the hamstring strength, but more on the um, testing through the Nordic hamstring exercise. And so we have um, studies from uh, an Australian group by uh, Anthony Shield and his colleagues uh, here, showing that a lower eccentric hamstring strength tested during the Nordic exercise was related to a higher risk ratio here in Australian footballers. We have pretty much similar data in uh, rugby union by uh, always the same group, 
of uh, researchers. And it says basically that if you have a previous injury and if you have a between limb imbalance in hamstring strength as tested during the Nordic, then you have a higher risk of hamstring injuries. And the very um, recent study by always the same group from Australia shows that, as you can see on this graph here, previous hamstring injury is related to a higher risk of injury. That's the white squares here. But the strength of the eccentric uh, hamstring um, exercise is also lower in a higher in subjects with a higher probability of injury. So basically, yes, uh, the overall strength of the hamstring group is a factor as, as, as measured during the Nordic exercise. But now the question we ask is, um, is there a, a link between performance and medicine here? And what is the role of hamstring muscle strength in sprint performance? So we don't talk about injury risk now. We only focus on sprint performance because as you, as you saw from the beginning, it's a win-win uh, philosophy. So basically, the literature says that, yes, when you have a hamstring injury history, um, you have a lower sprinting capability and vice versa. There's a link between sprinting and the risk of HSI. Then a, a hamstring injury induces an impairment in, in hamstring strength and vice versa. A lower hamstring strength has been related to a higher risk of injury. But what we don't know now from the literature is that um, is there a link between the strength of these muscles and sprint performance? Because if the answer is yes, then we can really have um, a comprehensive view of things on both performance and medical side. So that's what we wanted to investigate. If you look at the literature, uh, then you can have this hip extensor hypothesis. That's the hypothesis that says the hip extensors, namely glutes and hamstring muscles, um, play an important role when the speed is high and when the speed increases. And if you take a look at studies from Belly, Carolinen, Shash, Dorn and others, uh, well you see that when the speed increases in human running, the activity of hip extensors increases as well. But the big problem with these studies is that they are all studying high running velocities but not acceleration because it's always constant speed conditions like you go from 14 to 16 to 18 to 20 to 25 kilometers per hour but still at constant speeds and we wanted to focus on acceleration because we think it's very different in a study that we did in 2012 we had the opportunity to study a very high level sprinter his best time is below 10 seconds and when we had him sprinting on an instrumented treadmill, that you will see in a video later on, we saw that his ratio of force, which is the effectiveness of how horizontally he was able to apply the force onto the ground, that's the percent of the total ground reaction force vector that is applied horizontally, that's the, the, the part of the horizontal component. And you can see that when you compare this elite athlete in black to high-level athletes 10.5, 10.6 in white, and to non-specialists here, the obvious difference is made at high speeds of running, not at low speeds. So it means that this athlete is able, at high speed, to apply more horizontal force than the other uh, subjects we tested here. And so the big question is this, how can you produce high horizontal force onto the ground when your body is running at high speed. Because when your body is running at high speed, you have to remember that your position is upright. You're not crouched and engaged horizontally, um, you're upright. So if you take a look at animals who are able to accelerate a lot, bipeds, uh, they have a very powerful and a very high muscle mass at what would correspond to human hip extensors. And if you think of it from a functional perspective, how can you apply horizontal force onto the ground to propel yourself forward when you're in an upright position? Well, if you take a look at this picture here, if you want to go fast forward with the scooter here, functionally the muscles that you will need are hip extensors, glutes, hamstrings, and of course, but it's not going to be the topic today, 
the ankle muscles, the, the muscles that made your foot transmitting the force onto the ground. But we won't discuss that today. We will focus on hip extensors. And yes, in many sports um, in which hamstring strain injuries is, is a problem, we have accelerations from an upward, an upright, sorry, position because soccer players, rugby players always accelerate from an upright position and or from already a high running speed. So all of this makes sense, but it's not evident. So we wanted to um, collect some evidence to test that hip extensors hypothesis. So that was done in a 2015 study, as you can see here. Basically, to summarize the study, we took some uh, athletes and rugby players. We asked them to sprint on the treadmill to collect their horizontal force output. And we synchronized some muscular activity EMG measurements from the main muscles of the leg. And to have a rough idea of their muscular force capability in concentric and eccentric mode, we did some isokinetic testing. Well, it's not the best way because it's not the same speed, it's not the same angles, but we don't have the choice here because there's no technique now to quantify muscle force actually and accurately during sprinting. So we had some isokinetic testing there. Main results of the study, you can read the full paper if you want to have more details. First, yes, horizontal ground reaction force component is, is key to top speed running and, and acceleration. And the statistics that we did showed that basically the highest horizontal forces were found in subjects with high hip extensors force output in the isokinetic testing again. So gluteus in concentric mode and hamstring in both concentric and eccentric mode, but mostly the, the higher statistical result was taking the hamstring in eccentric mode force. And this is very important, a high EMG activity of the hamstrings of the biceps femoris during the end of swing phase, which is the end of swing is just before the foot touches the ground. It's the inversion of it's taking the leg from forward to the ground and kicking the leg backwards until the foot touches the ground. So basically, you don't need only hamstring eccentric force or only a high AMG activity, you need both. And subjects who were very strong but not able to activate the muscles did not have a high horizontal force. So the conclusion is very simple here. Um, we just have some evidence of course, it's only one study and, and we will need some more confirmations here, but we have evidence that a high hamstring force and hip extensors force is related to performance, horizontal force and acceleration, of course. And we know from the literature that it's also related to injury prevention. So that's the link that we made and that, that was the first step. We have this... Um, uh, sentence here, prepare and repair. When you focus on these muscles capability, you prepare for a good acceleration, but you also uh, prepare to repair or you repair if, you, if you're into rehab. So now let's take a look at uh, what we call the force velocity profile, because uh, doing the force velocity profile of athletes will help you to know better what makes them fast. It's not used to say who is fast and who is not. It's used to say where does sprint performance come from? So for example, here, if you take a look at this uh, typical force velocity profile analysis, we have two runners, a 40 meters test, 621 for the first one and 637 for the second one. So they were retired soccer players. It's just a testing like this. And if you just take a look at their 40 meters result, then you could say, wow, this one is slower than the other one. And so it is going to be, um, is going to do some sprint training, like um, uh, short distances, long distances sprinting, resisted sprints, over speed, etc., etc. But if you take a look at the force velocity profile of these two athletes, in fact, the velocity side of the FV curve here is very high in Frank, who is the slowest guy on the 40 meters. So basically, he has very high top speed capability. Once he has accelerated, is able to handle a pretty fast speed compared to his, his friend Ivan. And on the opposite, he is overall slow on the 40 meters, not because he has 
a low velocity capability, but because, but because it has a low horizontal force output at the beginning of the sprint. So basically, when the speed is low and he has to produce a high horizontal force, is not good compared to his colleague here. And uh, that's the reason for his lower 40 meters performance. And what you need to understand, and this is key, is that if I do a 20 meters test, the result will be even, even bigger, the difference will be greater. And if I do a 80 meters or 100 meter test, maybe the difference will be smaller. And I don't want my interpretation of athletes to depend on the test I chose. So when you do the FV profile, you have the entire characteristics. It's like uh, you do a test on every possible distance at once. So now let's take another, another example here. We have two players. Uh, they are from the, the academy of the FC Barcelona soccer club and they do a 30 meter test and they have the same result. So basically, if you don't take a look at the profile, you could say, well, uh, they have the same capability, let's train them the same. They are on the same team. But if you take a look at their profile, well, you see very different things uh, here. One has a very high top speed capability, but no horizontal force at the beginning. And the other one is exactly the opposite. And uh, the fact is that my test gave exactly the same performance output because it was exactly the distance for which these very opposite mechanical characteristics basically cancelled out and gave me the same picture. But the picture is very different. And if you think that, and it's our case, if you think that the first prevention of injuries in sports is within the training content, then you could say, okay, one of these two guys really doesn't need the same amount of top speed work compared to the other one and would rather have some force training. And it's the opposite for the other one. So the idea here is that the first prevention is if you better know the needs of each player, each athlete, then you can better design their training program and you can adjust their training content and maybe you can save some, for example here, unnecessary training sessions at high speed. Of course, we know that high speed is necessary to prevent hamstring injuries because if you never do top speed then you will have issues but we also know that if you do top speed too much then you also have issues so the idea here is to have a very specific training design that could play a role in both performance and prevention so now let's go to the when when can we use the FE profile in the context of a hamstring injury management that's the framework between medical and performance uh, fields. So first, yes, a hamstring strain injury will result in a lowered hamstring strength. Then we know that hamstring strength may be somehow related to horizontal force output and in turn sprint performance. And now the question that we want to answer here is, is horizontal force output related to the risk of injury, as it's the case with, uh, for example, uh, Nordic hamstring strength. So the first thing that we did, and this is why you have this, uh, this uh, symbol here, we want to bridge the gap between medicine and, and, and sports performance science. First study that we did with uh, Jordan Mendiguccia is that we just measured the profile of um, soccer players at two moments. First, at the return to sport. So it means they have the, the okay from their medical staff to go back to training and, 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 and playing full gas. So at that moment, because they are okay to play soccer again, we do a 30 meter sprint to calculate their profile. And we observe that in players with a history of hamstring injuries, we have a lower max power and we have a lower maximum horizontal force, that's what we call F0. So in their profile, their horizontal force at the beginning of the sprint is much lower than safe, non-injured players. And on the other side of the profile, their top speed is exactly the same as non-injured players. So it means that they have the same top speed capability, but they don't have the same maximum force output at the beginning of the sprint. So we think that 
from a functional perspective, even if they had the return to spot decision, they still have something impaired in their mechanical sprint profile. And the very key point in this study is that we were able to measure these players two months later. And at that moment, all the values were back to normal. Well, back to normal in this case means back to the data of the non-injured players, of course, because uh, we didn't have the pre-injury data of these players. So two questions from this study now. First, what were the objective and functional data that led to the return to spot decision? Because obviously something was still not recovered in their mechanical profile and, and, and we cannot be more specific than when doing a sprint. And the second question is, uh, what sort of risk did we take during this two month period? Because uh, the literature shows that um, the window of, of re-injury is within the first 20-25 days. 50% of the re-injuries at the hamstrings occur within 20 to 25 days. So it means maybe these players had a risk during this uh, period during which F0 was still uh, low compared to the other guys. But the big issue here is, yes, frustrating. We don't have pre-injury data. And that's the point here. So we started to monitor uh, some players. Um, and because in life, uh, in sports life, injuries happen, we were just waiting for injury to have some, some case studies, some case reports. So the first case I will show you, so everything was published in, in 2015. The first case is a soccer player for which, for whom we have a pre-injury profile and the post-injury profile. So in this case, of course, post-injury means at the moment of return to sports. And what do you see here? Well, you see exactly the same story as before. His force velocity profile has recovered top speed post rehab, but the return to sport decision was made despite a very, very, very high difference in the maximum force output at the beginning of the sprint. And our point here is that return to sport should be delayed because obviously, the player has not recovered his normal mechanical profile. His F0 is still impaired compared to himself before injury. And that's why the golden, the golden data really is the pre-injury profile. But if you don't have it, you don't know it. The second case was a rugby player from the, from the Auckland Warriors. That's a, a top team in New Zealand. During a 10 times 40 meter session, that was a pre-season repeated sprint exercise, the player has a major hamstring strain injury at the fifth sprint, as you can see here on the radar data. So that's pretty obvious that the, the hamstring injury occur, occurred here. So from a personal perspective, it's very <clears throat> dramatic, but from a scientific perspective, it's interesting because we can compare the force velocity profile from that specific player to himself at sprint number one, two, three, four. And we can also compare him to the group, to the rest of the team who did not have an injury at sprints one, two, three, and four. So if you take a look at this graph here, what you see is that the gray shadow, the gray shadowed area is the FV profile of the entire team, plus minus one standard deviation, okay? So that's the, that's the signature of that team. And on that team, the injured player, because we know, of course, who he is, so we know who he was at sprint number one, the injured player has both a very low F0 compared to the rest of the team and a very high top speed capability. So it's the same uh, uh, thing again. He's both able to run very fast once he has accelerated and is not able to produce a high horizontal force at the beginning of the sprint. So indirectly, very indirectly, but still we think this is related to a lower hip extension function and indirectly to a lower uh, hamstring power based on our previous results. And the very, very interesting thing is that at sprint number four, which is the sprint before the injury, what you see is that now the player is exactly the lowest F0 on the team 
and at the same time is still able to run very fast at the, at the end of the sprint acceleration. So of course, I don't say, and we cannot say that, I don't say that's the reason why he got injured. But all I see is that the only guy injured in this exercise and in this situation was the guy with the lowest F0 on the team. And at the So basically, uh, what we wanted to verify was that uh, these case studies were uh, confirmed by, by larger groups. Uh, so we did a prospective pilot study uh, with uh, Ryu Nagahara from uh, Japan. He was able to follow in, at his university some uh, competitive soccer players over an entire season. So the idea is that we have about 100 tested players at the beginning of the season and we will test them five times into the full season. And so after um, uh, removing all um, secondary injuries or hamstring injuries related to another previous injury, etc., we have six, let's say, pure um, hamstring injuries in, in this group. So the aim of the study will be very simple. Is the false velocity profile of the injured players, and especially their F0, related to a higher risk? And could it be? an objective variable in the prehab, the, the, the prevention process, and the rehabilitation process. So here I'm showing the data of the non-injured players in grey. So that's all the players at the beginning of the season, the F0 range of values. And here the circles are the players who will be injured into the season. And when the circles are white, it means they will be injured later into the season. And when the circles are uh, black, it means they will be injured before the next test. So it means within the weeks following that test. So players four and five will be injured after test one. What you see here is that basically uh, over the six players who will be eventually injured during the season, four of them are below the average and two of them are almost one SD below the average. But, but the ratio of risk, the risk ratio was not statistically different here. Then we go into the season. Of course, players four and five are not tested at test number two because they were still in rehab. And you see that the player will be injured between test two and test three is here at one SD below the average, is within the, the bottom, let's say, 20% of F0 values. Now let's go into the season test number three, nothing special. The two injured players are below the average, but once again, the risk ratio is not statistically different. And then the most, I think, important part of the season is test number four. We are eight weeks into the season. And you see here that the three players who will suffer a hamstring strain after test four are, in fact, below the SD, below the average of the group. They are within the, let's say, 10 uh, lowest F0 values. So, of course, um, we cannot say that because they have a low F0 that they will suffer a hamstring injury. We just say that it's the same story as in, in the case studies we've seen before. A uh, hamstring strain injury is uh, concomitant with a low F0 values. And the last testing of the season is uh, not very informative because not, nothing will be monitored afterwards. So now I want you to take a look at some specific players. Player number two is what we call a chronic rehabber. Is low in F0 here compared to the rest of the group. Is going to be injured there. Coming back from rehab, that's why he has a gray um, uh, circle here. Then low F0 again and injured again and back to rehab. Now I want you to focus on player number one because I think you've seen that Player number one is 1SD one above the average of the group. He's a high F0 guy. He has high force output. But at test number four, he has a major drop in F0. Basically, at test number three, he has almost eight newtons per kilo. That's one of the top guys on the group. And we don't know why. That's the frustrating part of the approach. We have a macroscopic approach, so we don't know what happened exactly what mechanism led to a lower F0, what we know is that when E accelerates, his F0 is now down to 6.6. .6. So it's a major drop between that testing and that testing. We have a report for this player. He had 
a slight ankle sprain with a few days off that was treated and, and rehabbed correctly. But still, we know that injury is a risk factor for subsequent hamstring injury. So the story may be that something has changed in his running mechanics. Well, obviously, something has changed. We don't know what exactly. Or maybe is it that on that day, he had some pain or whatever. I don't want to know exactly what happened. All I know is that we have a red flag that says, wow, this guy was pretty good here and is pretty down here compared to the group. And all I say is that at the same time, this guy will have a major hamstring injury a few weeks after that. The last thing is that um, at the same time, this player also had a very high V0. So he was one of the best top speeds on the group. And at test number four, the data are not shown here, but they will be discussed in the paper. At test number four, he has both a very high top speed capability that is maintained and a low maximum force capability. So it's exactly the same story as the rugbyman case studies before. So the, the take home message is very simple. Whoa, that's pilot data. It means when we will have more data collected and we are doing it now, we will know if these data are confirmed or not. So maybe F0 is a factor, maybe not. All we know is that in this pilot testing, four players had a lower F0 than the average and or a major drop in F0 before the injury occurred. And what we need to remember is that even if at the end of the story F0 is not a prevention factor, which is totally possible, we don't know what will happen, that's science. It is a factor in, in rehabilitation because as you've seen before, we include F0 and all the sprint mechanics into the rehabilitation program. And it is a factor in better programming the training. So I would say that even if it doesn't work for prevention, it is still very interesting for rehab and for training, which is cool. And the other cool thing is that the test that you need is only just a 30 meter sprint, which is something soccer, rugby, uh, track and field athlete should do easily on a regular basis. The next take home message is very simple. Performance and prevention, win-win. What do we know now? First, we know that yes, hamstring strengthening is useful in preventing hamstring injuries. Of course, hamstring strength is not the only factor. There's so many other factors, but stronger hamstrings may be useful. And we don't know yet if it's uh, useful to improve sprint performance, but some evidence are accumulating now. The next thing is, is the force velocity profiling uh, useful? Yes, it is for uh, better training programs, more individualized. And we have some data coming up showing that clearly, even in elite athletes. And the question that we ask is, is it a useful information to screen subjects? Again, maybe yes, maybe no, but the pilot data tend to show that yes. And as you know, uh, injury is multifactorial, so there's no one or two buttons in, in hamstring injuries. That would be cool, but uh, the dashboard of hamstring injury is a bit more like this dashboard on the right than like this dashboard on the left. But that's what's really exciting about our job is that we are dealing with very complex dashboards, but at least we have a chance to fly. So uh, this is the study I've talked to you about. Uh, it's a study about a multifactorial criteria-based progressive program for hamstring treatment. And the very innovative thing is that one of the steps, so basically the program is a step-by-step. -step. If, you, if you validate a step in the program, then you can go to the next step. If you don't, then you're still into that step and your rehab is a bit longer, but at least we know that you're ready for the next step. And the final step, and I really thank Jordan Mendiguccia for um, uh, bringing this uh, approach into his program. The last step is a functional step in which you need to sprint. And if your sprint mechanics and profile are, let's say, back to normal, which should be the, your normal data of pre-injury, or at least 
normal data for your group of age, position, type of, of, of sport, then you're okay to return to sport. If not, we consider that you are still in rehab because your mechanical profile is not back to normal. And of course, um, that's a prepare and repair approach because uh, we want to prepare you for sprinting. And, and so that's going to be integrated into the repair program. So your rehab may be a slightly longer, but at least when you're back on the track, you will have less issues. And that's what basically this study shows. And I, I, I really advise um, you read that study. So now let's go to the how. How can I do to know the mechanical profile of my athletes and, um, and to have their F0? Well, if this is a good information. Well, that's the bad news. Uh, the only possibility you have to know the force velocity profile in sprinting is uh, by measuring force and velocity and um, using some very costly devices. So there are some instrumented treadmills in France and Qatar on which you can measure uh, force during sprinting. Or you can go to a lab like in the National Institute of Sports in Paris on which you will have the guys sprinting on force plates. And yes, we can measure their horizontal force, but uh, you will agree with me, it's not very practical and uh, it's not very, let's say, it's not accessible to, to most of you. So um, my collaborator Pierre Samozino came with uh, the idea of a simple method to measure force, velocity and power during sprinting. I won't go into details here, but the method is based on the fact that when someone accelerates, a human in good health accelerates from zero to top speed, the increase in speed follows very, very, very closely an exponential pattern in time. So based on that exponential pattern in time, we can derivate velocity to obtain acceleration. And using the basic Newton uh, laws of motion, we can have a calculation of the horizontal force output. This exponential increase in speed is observed systematically in track and field athletes, in soccer players. Uh, the world record of Bolt follows that exponential function. You can see that in young sprinters like my boy. You can see that in old sprinters like this almost centenarian. And basically it means that we can use that model in any type of athlete. So I won't go into the details uh, for the, the equations. What I want to show you is that when you compare the equations and, and the force that we calculate, the, the force velocity profile between our equations and force plates data, you end up with very, very, very close values. Like here you have a sprint. The dashed line is our method. The dots here are force plate measurements. And basically you can see that you end up with the same values. Overall, the statistics show that the absolute bias between force plate reference data and our equations is between 2 and 5%, which is very acceptable in this context. And remember, you just need a radar gun or some splits to know the, the position time curve or the velocity time curve of athletes. So yes, we were pretty happy because we were able to, to give solutions uh, to many practitioners to follow up this mechanical profile. So for example here you have the mechanical profile of Usain Bolt for the world record. So only based on the speed of Bolt that was measured at that time with the laser, we can compute the horizontal force output and the force velocity profile. And for example, that's uh, hypothetical, but if Usain Bolt has a major hamstring injury and he goes into rehab, I know that his best shape, F0, is somewhere around 9 newton per kilo. And if he goes into rehab and he comes back and the first all-out sprint he does is only 7, 5 or 8, I know there's still some work to do and I know exactly what is missing. And that's the good point in the approach, in our opinion. And then one day, uh, a Spanish colleague comes and says, well, guys, um, if I understand your method, if I'm able to monitor the position of the center of mass over time during the acceleration, then I can compute everything, yes? And we said yes, as it was done here in uh, France by Etienne-Jules Marais. With four, 24 frames per second, you can say, okay, the center of mass is here, 
here, here at every position and you have the distance time curve. You can see it very well because here the guy is naked of course or you don't need to, need to be naked to do, to do sports science anymore. So he said, yes, if I have an iPhone or an iPad with 240 frames per second, I'm 10 times more accurate than, than Murray was at that time, and yes. And so what you can see here is that if you can film a sprinter, an athlete, a player from the side, and you can click on the app, each time the athlete crosses a 5 meter mark, like 5, 10, 15, etc., you can tell the app the split times and then the app can compute the entire mechanical profile. So they did a validation study in which they compare the app data to some split times with photo cells, timing gates, and radar, and the validation shows that there's a very good agreement between the methods. I did my own validation because even if I trust these guys for their uh, ethics, I did a validation with my students and the app gives very, very, very accurate results. So you can trust uh, the comparison that you do. And basically, if one of your players loses 10% in F0, then yes, you can measure it with this app. So what I'm going to do now is that uh, I'm going to do a little uh, practical demo for the app. So I'm going to open my, my iPad screen and show you what it's all about. So, sorry for the technical details. Here we go. So, yes, from the iPad, let's go. So, the idea is that you open the app and first of all, please, first of all, you read the instructions here. I, and you click on the question mark here. So, in these instructions, we have written everything so that you can understand what variables mean what. And you can have here the exact setting that you need to respect very, very thoroughly. You will have to set some poles on the track, on the side of the runner, because you will film the runners from the side, 10 meters away from a 15 meters mark. You need to do a 30 meter sprint, not more not less. And you set the poles on the track just to correct for the angle because when the, the sprinter, as you can see here, when the sprinter center of mass, which is roughly the, the center of the hips line, will be just behind the pole that you have set here, you know that it's roughly above the 10 meter mark in this case. So basically, the exact Positions of the pole are written here, you can see it there, 5 meters 57, 10 meters 28, exactly 15 meters because you, you are just in front of the 15 meters line, so there's no correction, etc, etc. And the very cool thing with the app is that you can film the athletes with the video camera of the iPad or the iPhone, in slow motion of course, and you can import the data to process them at home later after the session. So basically, if you want to test some athletes, you just set the poles, the athletes warm up, and they give their max on a 30 meters with a, with a clean standing still start. And then at home, you import the video as I will do, and you process everything. So I will now click on capture here. I will choose the subject, so let's say that it's gonna be Hugo. So I need to know the body mass, the height and, and the age here. And then the app opens the video. So you can film athletes or you can import videos from the videos you have filmed before, which is what I'm going to do here. So this is something I filmed in slow motion. And the idea now is that, as you can see, I have to indicate to the app when does the athlete cross each pole mark here. Sorry for the blurry screen because that's a display issue, but I, I have no choice. But on the iPad, it's much more uh, clear and visible. So the first moment is, you can use the zoom of the app here. The first moment is as soon as you see the athlete moving, because as soon as the body of the athlete is moving here, some force is being produced onto the ground. So you need to have the, the real start. Otherwise, you will overestimate force and power. So that's very important. So you just need to practice a little bit and it's very easy. So here is the real start of the athlete. So I click on start here and basically I just told the app that yes, you can start counting the picture, the, the frames here because that's basically what the app does. 
Then with the arrows on the side of the app, you can use a frame by frame approach. And as soon as you see the middle of the hips line behind the mark, which is here, you can click and say that's the five meters mark. If you're wrong by one picture, one frame, it's not a big deal because one frame at that frame rate is a four millisecond mistake and a four millisecond mistake doesn't change the story. Here we go, so middle of the hips line behind the bar and I click. Now we will have the 15 meters mark. So here the 15 meters mark is pretty simple because it's exactly in front of me as I film. So I take the middle of the hips line here and click. Then let's go to the 20. Oh, sorry. Too fast. Okay, here. So that's a little processing time. Sorry for that. We could not be faster. But as I said, you can do it at home or at the Starbucks or at the, at the pub uh, afterwards, of course. Well, don't do it at the pub because... 25 meters and now 30 meters is the end of the sprint, bam, 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 click. Now I told the app the distance time characteristics of the athlete and when I click on FV analysis, magic happens. The app is going to compute everything using our method. So here you have the list of important variables of the mechanical profile. The variables of interest today are maximum power, 17 watts per kilo, top speed, 9.1, and F0. This player on that sprint has a 7.51 newtons per kilo F0, which means that if he has a hamstring injury, I know exactly the target in my rehab process. You can have the graphs, of course, just for information, so you can have the profile. And you can compare the player to the rest of the group, and you can do that within the season because as you've seen, the testing is only a damn simple 30 meters sprint. Then you can save the data and you can send an email because in the email, the app is going to uh, edit an Excel compatible file, which is just a, a simple single line of data. You want to copy paste it to have your uh, players, to have your stats and to have your follow up. And that's it. So basically that was how the app functions. And I will go back to the, to the presentation here. So it's just the beginning of something uh, in this context. So we will bring some more data soon, especially how to train F0, how to correct F0 deficit in, in players, etc. And most of all, we are collaborating with groups to confirm this pilot testing data then yes, that's going to bridge the gap between research and practice. So we are working hard on designing good wheels and we thank our collaborators uh, who accept to give it a try and to help us say yes or no when we have something new to propose. At that point, I would like to thank all of my colleagues and all the guys you see here have uh, significantly contributed to all of that story. And uh, as I said before, it's only the beginning of the story. So uh, I just wish you stay tuned. I apologize for my voice and, and, and French accent. You can just read the slides uh, on ResearchGate for that workshop. And uh, well, see you all soon. Bye-bye, merci.